Hi, and welcome back to Purple Color Life. I'm Chad, and in today's video, we're talking about what is the smartest way to get electricity into our big 40 by 60 pole building. This building's been here for about 10 years now, and I've been doing it the wrong way with extension cords just to get some lights in here. Now, it's time to finally get some real power into this big 40 by 60 building, but I'd like to walk through the options with you so that you guys can let me know your thoughts on the safest and best way, and I'm hoping someone like Kyle from Spicer Designs, an expert on power, will give me some advice on his thoughts of power into this building. Definitely don't want to run over these limbs from the crab apple tree. These thorns will give us some flat tires. Before we get into that power discussion for the big building, I want to get some of this cherry loaded up from the tote and brought into the basement. The weather guys are saying we're going to get four plus inches of snow Monday night into Tuesday. So I want to get some of this brought in. I still have plenty of the cord of oak, but I like to mix this cherry in with it. This tub is exclusively cherry, and some people have said you should mix your cherry with other woods for safety reasons. So I like to try to mix a little bit in with that oak. You may have noticed there were a couple less videos recently. I said in a previous video that I have a lot of travel coming up this year for work. Exit right to exit 198 I-79 South toward Pittsburgh. I actually just got back from two weeks in Southern California. And I can tell you things are different in California when you're used to Northwest Pennsylvania. Now I've been making that trip to Southern California for probably eight years now, spending about two weeks there, always about this same time of year. Sometimes during the Super Bowl weekend, sometimes a little bit before or a little bit after. I know we often hear people say that Southern California is the land of sunshine, it never rains. I can tell you that pretty much every time I go, it always rains. This time was not the exception to that rule. In fact, it was downpours, they had flood warnings. There's just nowhere for that water to go when it comes down, you know, nine inches over a couple days period. They had landslides, so I was always in a safe spot, but a lot of the area around me was heavily affected by the weather. Another thing a little bit different in California, it's a great place if you want to live the keto lifestyle. So I enjoy uh, eating keto as a diet, and it's a lot easier in Southern California than it is in Northwest Pennsylvania. Partially because when you're there on your own, you can just order the meals that you want, and they always fit within that keto requirements. And also because there's a lot more options there than there are here. There were a couple earthquakes while I was in California. To be honest, I never even felt them. I only heard about them on the news. Now I was on my feet working the whole time, but there was nothing drastic about the earthquakes that we had while I was there. The other thing I noticed about California, the cars last forever. No rust, so you see a lot of classic cars that are just in really nice shape. Um, so it's a great place if you've got a, a nice car and you wanna keep it nice, Southern California is definitely the place to be. Something else I learned while in California, and maybe I've just been oblivious to the fact because I've always lived here in Northwest Pennsylvania, not everyone watches Punxsutawney Phil on February 2nd. That's right, I've seen the movie Groundhog Day, and I assume the whole United States watched Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, and pulling Groundhog Punxsutawney Phil out of his hut to see if he sees his shadow or not. What I learned watching the news on February 2nd this year is that not all the country recognizes Punxsutawney Phil as the authority on whether or not spring will come early. In fact, there's all kinds of different animals. A lot of people do have groundhogs. There's another one in Ohio. There's another one in other parts of the country. One state even has a lobster they pull out to see if it sees its shadow. I thought that was very interesting. But certainly, the more you expand your travels, the more you learn that things are different compared to where you grew up and the places you know. So like I said, I always thought Punxsutawney Phil was the prognosticator for weather, even though he's only right 30% of the time. I learned that there are other 
rodents and critters and animals that are used in other sections of the United States to determine if spring is coming early. Now Punxsutawney Phil did say that spring's coming early here. It does feel like it's pretty nice out today. We are at the start of February. It's a little chilly, about 40 degrees, and like I said, we've got that snow coming. But the weather has been pretty mild for the majority of this winter. Okay, let's talk power. Electricity comes from the pole way up in the electric right away, overhead to this pole, where it is then down the length of the pole and buried to the back of the house, quite a ways away from me. We're actually by the garage right now, so it gets buried behind the garage, underneath the sidewalk, and into the back of the house. That's where it all starts. And the way I see it, there are basically three options to get power to my big building. And today we're gonna to talk through those three options to see which one makes the most sense, which one's the smartest, thinking about the future and about my pocketbook. As a refresher, and I've covered this in a couple previous videos about firewood and heat, our house is all electric. There was no natural gas available here on our side of the main road. We are quite a ways back here in the woods and it would have cost a small fortune to get natural gas buried back here to the house. So when we built the house about 22 years ago, we opted for all electric. We use electric baseboard heat as backup heat in all of our rooms. Our primary heat is the combination of the wood stove in the basement and the pellet stove in the addition. So we've got 200 amps of power coming into the house. It originally went into the main section of the house. When we put the addition on, we actually had to run it through the addition overhead in the floor joist of the addition to the first power panel, the original power panel where the 200 amps come in. From that power panel, as you can see, We've got a lot of power going out of it. All those baseboard heaters, all our appliances, the electric range, electric uh, clothes dryer, electric water heater, electric water well pump. So a lot of electricity coming out of that 200 amp main panel going all throughout the house. Then we took 100 amps out of that 200 amp panel, took it to the addition. So the addition has a 100 amp panel that is powering everything in the addition. Again, we've got baseboard heaters, we've got all the electrical outlets and everything in the addition. From that 100 amp panel, we took a 50 amp off of that, buried it to the garage. So let's go from the beginning here. We've got the power at the transformer here at the pole outside, buried in to the house, 200 amp main panel, 100 amp sub panel, 50 amp sub panel in the garage. So my options were to get power to the big building. I was thinking of trenching with the new Takeuchi mini excavator, a trench from the garage and going to the big building and trying to get as much power as I could from there. Now that 50 amps that we're taking into the garage gets used for lighting in the garage as well as the charging station for our Chevy Volt. So we do have that 240 volt charger that charges the volt within four hours. We love that in the garage, but it does use quite a bit of the capacity that we're bringing into the garage. So my question is, if I trench from the garage to the big building, then I've got my 200 amp going to a 100 amp sub panel, going to a 50 amp sub panel, and in theory going to either another 50 or 30 amp sub panel in the big building, and is 50 or 30 amps over there enough? Right now all I have is lighting, but maybe someday I'll wanna get that garage insulated, the big 40 by 60 building insulated. It does have high peak ceilings. We've got scissor trusses at the back to play basketball, and we've got over 16 foot ceilings at the front in the flat part of the ceiling. So either, you know, if we're heating that building and we're insulating it, it's gonna take a lot of power to heat the building. I have thought about things like uh, propane to heat, that's not really ideal for me here. I think I'd go through way too much propane heating that large space. Obviously it's too late to put uh, thermal piping in the concrete and we'd have to heat that somehow, again, without natural gas. So option one of 30 amps to 50 amps in the building that maybe someday I wanna heat, maybe someday I wanna have a welder in there, maybe someday I'd like to have an electric car lift in there. Um, I'm just wondering if that's gonna be enough power for the future in that building. So option two would be to trench. So we've got the trench coming into the house from back here at the pole to find a way to trench all the way back out over here to the building and steal another section of power from our power panel. We'd have to take it from the 100 amp sub panel 
because our 200 amp is pretty much full. So we'd be taking a sub panel off the 100 amp panel, maybe 100 amps, maybe 50 amps, coming all the way back around here and up to the building. Now that would be a little pricey because that's a long distance. We've got a trench underneath the sidewalk. We've got to go alongside where this other power line is. So it's a lot of trenching, a lot of power line to be buried. And that power line is not cheap if you're talking about 100 amps or 50 amps going that massive distance. You're going to have to have a, a, a heavy duty power line to convey that power that far. The third option, and the option I think I'm most considering at this point, is to take a second line from the pole, either buried or overhead, directly to the building. We could have a 100 amp line or 200 amp line go right into the building that we were not taking off of our 200 amp, 100 amp, 50 amp sub panels to then power the big building. That sounds like the best way to go thinking about the future. But if I add another meter, which that would be a separate power source into our property, would have another meter, at today's rate, that's $33 a month just for the meter. Obviously, we would have the additional electricity we would pay for either way, regardless of where that power is coming from. But the $33 a month is the current rate. Obviously, that's going to go up over time. But just in a one-year period, we're talking over $350 just to have that second meter. And calculate that out over you know, the next 40 years that I'm going to be living here, that's $15,000 just having the second meter to give me 100 amps or 50 amps or 200 amps into that building. So I'm curious to know you guys' thoughts. Should I stick with option A, steal power from the 50 amp sub panel in the garage, going 200 amp, 100 amp, 50 amp sub panels into the big building and trench that across I had, as I had originally planned. Maybe I'll never need more than 50 amps or 30 amps in that building. Maybe I'll never heat it. Maybe I'll never end up getting a vehicle lift in there, and maybe I'll never end up wanting to do any welding over there. So that's option one, and probably the most economical option. Option two, I'm kind of ruling out just because of the price of the cable, the hassle of trenching all that line back around, and mostly the hassle of trenching underneath my sidewalk and potentially damaging the sidewalk and the French drains and everything that's along that back corner of the house. I've pretty much ruled that option out. And then option three, power from the pole, makes probably the most sense as far as having the most power available. And it would be done mostly by the electric company other than making the final connections into the building. It could be overhead or it could be buried underground from this post. Either way would be fine. But it's going to cost another $33 a month right now. I imagine, you know, over the rest of my life, that's going to keep going up and up and up. But even if it was only $33 a month, for the next 40 years, that's $15,000 extra to get power to that big building. Another thing I considered is as far as heating this building, maybe I could use a wood stove. We do cut all that firewood and a wood stove would probably heat this area okay if it was all insulated. But as you can see, this is where we store a lot of equipment that takes fuel. So we've got the go-kart, the tractor, the Mini-X, the side-by-side, -side, the zero turn, and two boats that we store all winter long in the building here. Those boats sit full of fuel because if you fill the tank up, there's less room for condensation to build up in the wintertime. So you always want to have your fuel tanks full for the winter. So I wouldn't really want to have an open flame or even a wood stove flame here in the building when I'm trying to store all this equipment. It's just not the safest way in my mind to heat a building like this. Yes, spring hopefully is coming sooner and that means more mud. So we've got some time to think about this. I don't wanna have the Mini X out there in the mud really ripping things up. And with the Mini X, I could make the trench pretty much wherever I need it to go, whether it's from the pole here to the building or from the garage here to the building or even from the back of the house, except for that sidewalk issue. So I'm looking forward to the comments down below what you think is the best way. I think the best future proofing way is to get that power directly from the pole to here to have 100 amps or so brought into the building. Should be plenty of power for everything I need here. You know, when I first put 200 amps in the house, I thought, well, that's a lot of power. It's going to be plenty. And as we learned with the addition and the garage, you keep splitting that off little by little. 
what you thought was going to be plenty ends up being just enough and maybe even tight on total power use. So I'm semi leaning towards power from the pole, but it's just really hurting my wallet to think about that extra $33 a month for payments for a second meter for the power that's coming into this building. Leave those comments down below on your thoughts and let me know if you've traveled across the country, what different animals predict or prognosticate the end of winter and the start of spring in where you live or where you've traveled to. Like I said, I always thought it was Punxsutawney Phil across the whole world that predicted the start of spring. Turns out I was just living here in my own little window, not realizing that across the country, there are lots of other animals that do the predicting. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Leave those comments down below and we'd love to see you again the next time. If you're not currently subscribed to us here on Purple Collar Life, consider clicking that subscribe button and watching along as we complete projects here in Northwest Pennsylvania. Thanks for watching. Have a great week. We'll see you again the next time.